saying you want to you want to model the transition as you enter the inflationary period. Yes. Is there a, also a problem about modeling the exit? You said you said further work needs to be done. Right. Ah, I see. Right. So so there is a there is a possibility that um, um, that uh, so if you have at the end of pre-inflation, if you have a non-equilibrium at the long wavelengths. Um, that maybe, you know, during the transition, I mean, my guess is it won't happen. It might be during the transition you'd get some relaxation, but, but, but it has to be studied. Um, but at egg, you're saying, what happens at the end of inflation? Why am I not worried about that? So the reason is that during inflation, um, the inflaton perturbation, the wavelengths are growing, they go outside the Hubble radius, and they form essentially classical curvature perturbations that then they're sitting far outside the Hubble radius and they, they don't evolve. Because of the, the dynamics of the way perturbations evolve on expanding space, when the wavelength is very large, it is sort of oblivious to short wavelength physics. So if something complicated happens at the end of inflation, the, the inflaton decay, I mean, that's a local short wavelength process, the reheating of the universe short wavelength process, those uh, super Hubble perturbations w will be essentially unaffected by that. So that's not a worry. Thank you. Um, David Wallace. This is just to try to get a bit clearer on how, how this is working um, as, in, in terms of predictive power. So, so the naive worry would be that if you just say that um, the distribution isn't at equilibrium, then as long as we've only essentially got this relatively small data set, rather than say lots and lots of different chunks of non-equilibrium matter, you'd worry that that would you know, give us so much freedom we could fit virtually anything. Right. Now that yes. doesn't seem yes. to be the case in the framework you've got here, but I'm, you want to yes. say a bit as to why yes. that is? Yes, yes, so that, that's a good point. So um, in this theory, once you, uh, you know, as one might say, if you liberate yourself from the born rule, then the initial distribution can be anything. And so there is, in principle, you know, I could find an initial distribution that would produce anything that we happen to see. So then it's just matching uh, things and, you, you, and you're not... Um, you could take a phenomenological view and say from data we'll deduce what the initial distribution was, but you know, it, 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 for this to be really scientific, one, one wants to make predictions. So, um, and that is why I focused on looking at the dynamics here and trying to see, is there something natural that comes out of the dynamics which would, would suggest where you're going to see non-equilibrium? And this mechanism, which simply comes out of the equations, that relaxation is suppressed on large scales. Now, of course, in principle, it could be that, well, maybe on large scales we were already in equilibrium and so on. And, you know, there's still this thing that you can match anything with just by choosing initial distribution. But if you kind of say, well, you know, let's say that a reasonable, if you're, if you're saying that quantum noise originated from a dynamical process in the early universe, it sounds plausible to say, well, let's take the initial distribution to have a width that's smaller than the quantum distribution on more or less all wavelengths. Let's make that, I mean, we have to make some assumptions here. If you make that assumption, then it comes naturally out of the dynamics that at short wavelengths you'll have equilibrium and at long wavelengths there'll be a deficit. Um, again, that isn't enough because, um, you know, one... There are a lot of parameters one has put in, assumptions, the, 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 and of course this is in many people's eyes a very speculative theory, and there's only this guy Valentini working on it, why on earth would we ever believe this? We need to make more predictions. So um, here is um, a, a, a po sort of possible next step that we're thinking about would be to, um, well the various things, one would be uh, let's um, model in detail how this non-equilibrium evolves through the transition and see if there are any particular features of this, this xi, this non-equilibrium function that pop out and look at the best fit to data. Another idea is, um, and as the Planck team say in their paper, they have two puzzling things they've discovered at long wavelengths, power deficit and an anisotropy. They're in the same region of, of k-space, maybe they're related. Here we have a model which would seem, well, I can naturally get both effects. You know, I can kill two birds with one stone. 
So one would have to, the next steps would be, well, let's start with some model. Let's say, for example, we're going to tweak our model to try to fit the power deficit. Okay, well, we'll start with some initial conditions in our non-equilibrium distribution. We'll evolve forward in time and we'll see, can we explain the power deficit? And of course, I've got to fit the number of e-folds and so on. If then I find that when I evolve forward in time, and I, if I assume initial anisotropy, I also get some kind of matching with the anisotropy. Then I'm starting to explain two things with one assumption. Um, there are also other things one can look at, non-Gaussianity. Um, um, so, but certainly, the just you know, fitting data to, to initial parameters is not enough. What, the aim now is to make predictions and to explain more with less. Okay. Um, uh, on this note, more with less. Thank you. Thank you.